Hey there folks, Tim Slate here from the eLearning Designers Academy. You know, interviewing for a job, any job, whether it's an instructional design job or an e-learning development job, interviewing requires practice. Like, yeah, you know, you can sit there and think about and write out how you would answer all of the different interview questions. But you know what? Practicing how to respond on the spot to questions that you don't know are coming is where the real magic happens. And sometimes, you know, you don't feel comfortable or have access to a trusted friend or colleague to help you do all of that. Well, guess what? This is where AI can actually help you. So in this video, I'm going to show you how you can practice your instructional design interviewing skills using ChatGPT. So let's jump into it. All right, so here I am on my computer where I have the ChatGPT desktop app installed. Now, before we jump into this, I'm using ChatGPT. I'm using the paid version of ChatGPT, which is, I think, right now, $20 a month. You could very easily do this with the free version of ChatGPT, or you could probably do this with any AI tool that has a voice interface, because we want to actually practice verbalizing and talking like you do in an interview, right? Uh, so I have ChatGPT here, and the first thing I want to do is I want to talk to it to make sure it can do what I want it to do. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the vocal interface here. ChatGPT, can you hear me? Loud and clear. What's on your mind today? So I am getting ready to uh, prepare for an upcoming job interview, and I was hoping that you could help me practice answering some different interview questions. Of course, I'd be happy to help. Do you have any specific questions in mind, or should we start with some common ones? That's a great question. Well, it's going to be for an instructional design job, and I actually have the job description, so I'd love to practice some recruiter screening questions along with some hiring manager questions that are based on the actual job description. So if I were to paste that in, would that help you? Absolutely. That would be really helpful. Feel free to share the job description, and we can tailor the questions to match what they're looking for. All right. I love that. Give me a moment to copy and paste it in. Sure, take your time. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself there for a moment and exit out of the vocal interface. Uh, now, one of the things that you hear people talk about all the time online is about prompt engineering and how to write a prompt and all that stuff. I don't, I haven't spent any time learning about problem en engineering or any of that. I, I find that ChatGBT and AI generally works best when I interact with it like there's another freaking human being on the other end of this, right? So you'll notice that I, I told it what I wanted it to do. I asked it some questions and it is already like optimizing itself or programming itself or whatever the phrase that people use to do what I want it to do. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and paste in this job description here. Let's paste it in there. I'll send it on off, and we're going to go into the vocal interface here. All right, ChatGPT, do you have that job description that I shared with you earlier? Yes, I do have the job description for the instructional designer role that you shared. Is there something specific you'd like to discuss about it? Yeah, I want to continue our interview practice. So I'd like to start with practicing some basic recruiter, recruiter screening questions. If you could act as a recruiter, and then I'm going to act as the candidate, and uh, you can interview me and then maybe give me some feedback at the end. Absolutely. I'm happy to help with that. Let's get started. Hi, thanks for joining the interview today. To begin, can you tell me a little about yourself and why you're interested in this instructional designer role? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, well, you know what? I've been working in the field of instructional design for a little over 15 years now. Like a lot of folks who um, currently work in the industry, I fell into it by accident. I used to catch shoplifters for a living. Uh, I have a degree in criminal justice, and then I made my way into retail learning and development. And then over the last, you know, 15 years, I've had a really great career where I've had the opportunity to experience working in this industry in various instructional design and e-learning development roles from uh, the private sector to the public sector, working for the state of Wisconsin. And then I, I spent some time working for a custom e-learning development company, creating custom solutions. And then I spent some years freelancing. And then most recently, I worked as the director of instructional design, managing a global team of instructional designers 
um, at a technology company. And I think, you know, what interests me most about uh, this position is that as I was reviewing the job description, it seemed very mission focused because it's focused on learners with neurodivergencies. And I think that, you know, really speaks to um, it's a very mission driven organization, which is which is what appeals to me. Thank you for sharing that. It's great to hear about your extensive experience and how you transitioned into instructional design. Your journey definitely brings a unique perspective to the role. Now, can you tell me about a time when you had to design a training program from scratch? What was your process like and what challenges did you face? Oh my gosh, um, I've had to design and develop so many different training programs from scratch over the years. You know, I think one that comes to mind was when I worked at my last job at the technology company, we had uh, an initiative to do um, a sales consultation training. And so one of the first things that I did before we actually started uh, developing any training is we started by conducting a needs analysis. And we did that with a series of uh, focus groups with our target learners, and then also looking at past data about sales trends. One of the things that was really important to us is that we didn't want this training to just be a blanket training that went out to everybody. We wanted it to be really targeted to those people who needed these sales consultation skills. So we started by looking at the data. We did the focus group. That helped us uh, you know, helped influence where we we needed to focus our training, not just in terms of the content, but also who the audience was. And so uh, as after we took that information, we discovered that the primary focus and the primary need was on consultative sales with a really big emphasis on overcoming customer objections. And so in order to do that, we we focused on the design and development of the project with a with a true blended model. So we started with an um, uh, an asynchronous e-learning course that went out to all of the learners, uh, helping them understand the consultative sales framework uh, and understanding the basics of overcoming objections. And that included some branching scenarios and, and other interactions to help them um, understand the basics of the skill set. And then for those learners who really, really needed the added hands-on practice, those ones who are really underperforming, then they went to an in-person workshop where they would actually practice those skill sets um, with a series of mock conversations with customers and whatnot. And then the final thing that we did is we also created a coaching guide for leaders because we realized that the stuff that we were creating as formal training was only going to be as good as how leaders were going to promote those things um, back on the job. And so we created some training for leaders on how to coach their employees along with a coaching guide that they use to provide um, feedback to their, their teams on a regular basis. After we implemented that, then we continued doing some focus groups. We continued looking at the numbers. We did some A-B testing and some pilots of the program to see what was working and made you know relevant updates along the way as we continued to iterate and finalize that training. But that was, that was, that was a really good project from beginning to end in a nutshell. That's a fantastic example. You clearly demonstrated a thorough process from needs analysis to implementation and evaluation. Great job. For some feedback, you highlighted how you identified the training need and adapted your approach based on the audience, which is excellent. It might also be helpful to mention specific challenges you encountered and how you overcame them, as this can showcase your problem-solving skills. Ready for the next question? I'm going to mute this real quickly. All right. See how it just gave me really good feedback? That's that's a totally valid bit of feedback. I didn't mention any of the challenges that we faced in that situation. So that's a really great example where it's paying attention to the great stuff that I'm doing, but it's it's also paying attention to where I needed to improve my storytelling process, right? And maybe that would have involved, you know, really honing in on the star uh, response model or something along those lines, right? So let's keep going. Yeah, let's keep going. Ask me the next question. All right. Next question. Can you describe a time when you had to collaborate with subject matter experts on a project? How did you ensure effective communication and collaboration? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, there there isn't a project I've ever worked on where I didn't have to collaborate with some sort of stakeholders or subject matter experts. My philosophy when it comes to interacting with subject matter experts is that I own the process, right? I I don't take a passive role. You know, when when somebody's acting as a subject matter expert, they are 
they're doing that outside of their regular job, right? They're taking time out of their regular job to, to work with us as instructional designers. So I try really, really hard to bring my subject matter experts along with me in the process to make their participation in the project as easy as possible. And so for me, that starts with having a really good kickoff meeting where I explain roles and responsibilities. I tell them exactly what it is that I'm going to need from them and when I'm going to need it from them. And uh, I give them a really good overview of how the project process works and how they're actually participating in it. And then once we're actually in the project, you know, working with subject matter experts might involve conducting interviews or um, involving them in the process, like creating an action map or recording um, our conversations or shadowing them. I mean, it, it really depends on the project. Um, but then along the way, you know, I, I try to have regular touch bases with them, you know, if not once a week, every couple of weeks, just to keep them involved and uh, up to date with the project. And then when it comes to getting them involved with giving feedback and reviewing my work, that's another area where I take a really proactive stance. I don't like just sending something off and expecting them to know what to do with it. So I'll send off a storyboard or whatever it is that they're reviewing, and I will include really clear instructions about you know, what it is that I'm sending them, what it is that I want to get back from them, and then um, a deadline. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, one of the challenges that I that I have faced, I know a lot of other instructional designers face, is um, when subject matter experts go missing on you, right? So in those instances, that's where I'll um, typically take a more hands-on approach. Maybe I'll schedule a live review meeting where they can come and meet with me, and we can go through this stuff together and implement edits in real time. That can really be a time-saving a tactic that has worked with me many times in the past. So I feel like I'm rambling, but uh, that's kind of an overview of how I work with, with subject matter experts. That's a thorough and proactive approach. It's great that you emphasize clear communication and setting expectations with subject matter experts. For feedback, your strategies for keeping SMEs engaged and addressing challenges like them going missing are excellent. Highlighting specific tools or techniques you use to facilitate collaboration could further showcase your expertise. Let's move to the next question. Yeah, let's go ahead and ask the next question. How do you stay current with trends and best practices in instructional design and e-learning development? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, trends are constantly changing in our industry. And so there's a lot of different ways that I stay up to date, whether it's uh, attending conferences or uh, seeing what, you know, different people in the industry are talking about on YouTube or LinkedIn. Um, one of my favorite resources for different trends is the Association for Talent Development. Um, I oftentimes like to go and attend local ATD events uh, for our local ATD chapter. Uh, and that's really helpful because then you're actually interacting with people more working in the industry and you can find out what actual organizations and actual L&D teams are implementing in the real world. That's a great approach. Staying connected through conferences, platforms like LinkedIn, and professional associations like ATD definitely helps in keeping up with industry trends and best practices. Ready for another question? Yeah, you know what, actually, why don't we change the questions and we do some hiring manager questions? Got it. Let's switch to some hiring manager questions. To start, can you tell me about a particularly challenging instructional design project you managed? What made it challenging and how did you handle it? Gosh, you know, one of the projects that I'm thinking about is uh, one time I worked on a project, it was a freelance project with a client. And when we were starting the project, I was scoping it out. And one of the things that they wanted to do to, I assume, save money is they wanted to skip uh, the whole step of having a prototype. And they wanted to just go straight from storyboarding straight into development without the step of having a prototype to see how the course would look visually and how the interactivity would work. Now, at the time, you know, I was new to freelancing and I, I wasn't sure how to push back on that. So I went along with it and we did, you know, we, we did the first draft of the course. I probably spent like 60 hours on it. And uh, we, the stakeholder came back, the, the client came back, and they were so unhappy with it because they had a clear vision in their mind of what they wanted, but that didn't get communicated, and I did not push back enough, right? And so that was a good example where I had a, 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 a troubling stakeholder, in this case, a client. 
Um, but I'll tell you what I learned from that experience that's helped me as I've moved forward is um, one of the things that I do now is I check in early and often. And I help my stakeholders and my subject matter experts and my clients understand the consequences or the potential consequences of not following the process that we've outlined. You know, the process exists for a reason, right? And so sometimes they need to have that context in order to appreciate and understand why we've designed it the way we've designed it, right? So that was a good example where I had a, a, a troubling client, a bit of a challenge, um, and w you know what I learned from it and, and how I've taken those lessons going forward. That's a valuable learning experience. You effectively communicated how you navigated a challenging situation with a client and the proactive steps you now take to ensure smoother collaboration. Highlighting these lessons learned and how you've incorporated them into your process is excellent. Would you like to try another question? Yeah, let's do one more question. Sure. Here's another. Can you share an example of a time when you had to adapt your instructional design approach to meet the needs of a diverse group of learners? What changes did you make and why? Mm, that's a really good question. How have I had to change my instructional approach to meet a diverse set of learners? You know, I think... Um... Take your time to think it over. Whenever you're ready, feel free to share your example. All right, let me think about it. Give me a moment. Of course. Take all the time you need. Whenever you're ready, I'm here to listen. Okay, I'm gonna mute it there. It's a really good example where it it sounds like it detected that I was struggling with the answer and told me to take the time that I needed. Now, right now I can't think of a question off the top of my head, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip this question. But that was a good example of how I've been able to use or how you could use ChatGPT Chat and AI to like practice these sorts of conversations, right? So you can kind of understand what uh, what you might be asked by a hiring manager or in this case, you know, a recruiter. So let's wrap this up. All right, we're gonna go ahead and skip that question for now. Um, I'm, I wanna wrap up this session. So is there any uh, overall feedback you wanna give me on my interviewing style? Absolutely. Overall, you communicated your experiences and insights clearly and effectively. You did a great job of providing detailed examples and demonstrating your problem-solving skills and adaptability. For improvement, consider focusing on condensing some of your answers slightly to keep them concise and directly tied to the specific question. It can also be helpful to emphasize your key takeaways or lessons learned in each situation. Overall, you did a fantastic job. Keep practicing and you'll do great. If you have any other questions or need more help, I'm here. All right, thank you so much for your help. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. I'm glad I could help. If you need anything else or want to practice more in the future, just let me know. Good luck with your interviews. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So that was a brief example of how you can use AI, specifically ChatGPT, to help you practice your interviewing skills. But you can do this with any AI tool that has a voice interface. And you know what the great thing is? Not only does it give you the opportunity to actually practice and get feedback on how you respond, but you can actually have it interview you against what's actually in the job description. So I want to know what you think. Do you think this would be a helpful process for you? Have you used AI to help you practice your interviewing skills? What has been your experience? What other tips would you share? Whatever the case might be, comment down below and let me know what you think. Otherwise, I want to thank you so much for watching. If you haven't done so already, please make sure to click that like, subscribe, and bell button to get alerted the next time I publish a video just like this one. And of course, join us inside the eLearning Designers Academy at elearningacademy.io, where we help new instructional designers and eLearning developers grow their careers by focusing on skills first. Otherwise, my name is Tim Slade, and until next time, I'll see you around.